Before we begin, we pay our respects to the traditional custodians of this land, the Gaibal and Jarrawee people, who have cared for this country for thousands of years and who continue to do so. And we join together this morning with the Uniting Church across all of Australia, living into our covenant relationship with Indigenous people. And as people of faith, we do this as an expression of the reconciliation which Christ calls us to. We're going to begin by singing, Be Thou My Vision. Let's stand and sing. as a divine warrior who will bring about justice for all creation. And the armour of God includes the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation. In Isaiah, God alone is the source of justice. And in Paul's letter, he instructs the Christian community to align themselves with God's justice, God's wholeness, and God's harmony. So let's take a moment now to still our own hearts, that we may align ourselves with the way of God. Loving God, gracious God, 
We pray for your blessing on us as we gather today. Here, may the restless find a place to be still. And the careless be awakened to compassion. Here, may the questioner find courage for the quest. And the anxious find peace. Here, may the sorrowful be comforted. And the tempted find freedom from temptation. Here, may the strong be renewed and the aged find consolation and the young be inspired to live in your way. The way of Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. all of those things we ask for, whether it be peace or courage or renewed vision, come to us through the power of God's love. So let's stand and see the power of your love. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 20. What then shall we wear as we set ourselves the task of living in God? How shall we defend ourselves from those who wish us harm and want to attack us and make us lose the way of love? Fasten truth around your waist 
and cover your heart with a breastplate of righteousness. Let your shoes be ones that offer strong support as you walk the path of peace. When you feel you are attacked, put up a shield of faith and don the protective helmet of salvation. Your defence is the Spirit and the Word of God. These things are more powerful than any evil force. Let the Spirit be with you and within you as you pray, no matter what your petition might be. In fact, pray always. Pray for all the saints and also pray for me. As I am bound in chains, it is hard to be bold, yet I seek to speak the mystery of the gospel of the risen Christ with all my strength when it is given to me. Pray that I will be able to undertake this task. And in these words, we hear God speak to us. Amen. We're going to talk about the next chapter of our Way of Forgiveness study. We've talked about uh, understanding that when we, we suffer, when we experience injustice, it's very normal uh, to feel angry about that. Uh, we've talked about letting go of our own, uh, our own shame and injury in order to be able to open ourselves to God's forgiveness. And now today we're talking about the issue of forgiving others. And forgiving others is a struggle for all of us at one time or another in our lives. But one of the greatest stories of forgiving another person is the story of Corrie Ten Boom, who I've mentioned to you before because she's been a, a, a mentor to me. She was the author of uh, the extraordinary book, The Hiding Place. She and her family rescued Jewish people in their homeland of Holland, right in the middle of the Nazi occupation of their homeland. They were eventually found out and uh, were all committed to concentration camps. And Corrie was one of the very few members of her family who survived the concentration camps. And this is Corrie speaking. It was in a church in Munich where I was speaking in 1947 that I saw him. A balding, heavy-set man in a grey overcoat with a brown felt hat clutched nervously between his hands. In a moment, I saw him no longer as the person in the overcoat and the brown hat. I saw him in the blue uniform of a concentration camp guard with a visored cap on which were the skull and crossbones. And my memories of that concentration camp came back with a rush. It was as if I was once again in that huge room with its harsh overhead lights. In the corner, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes that we'd been forced to take off. I felt again the terrible shame of having to walk past this man naked. And I saw again my sister Betsy's frail form walking ahead of me, her, rib, her ribs sharply etched beneath the dry parchment of her malnourished skin. 
Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. And this man, this man who stood before me now, had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. But now, in this church in 1947, he stood in front of me and he thrust his hand out and he said to me, a fine message, Fraulein, how good it is to know that as you say, all of our sins are at the bottom of the sea as soon as we confess them before God. He wanted to shake my hand and I was horrified. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze in my veins. I heard his voice coming to me through my numbness and he was saying, you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk and I was a guard there. But since that time, I have become a Christian. I have confessed my sins and I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear forgiveness from your lips as well. Again, he put his hand out. Fraulein, will you forgive me? Well, it could not have been many seconds that he stood there with his hand held out, but it seemed hours to me as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it, and I knew it. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive others their trespasses against you, Jesus says, then neither would your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. But still I stood with coldness clutching my heart. I knew that forgiveness is an act of the will and the will can function regardless of the temperature in our hearts. And so I prayed silently Oh, sweet Jesus, help me. If I can lift my hand, if I can just do that much, you do the rest. And so, woodenly, mechanically, almost reluctantly, I reached out my hand and I clasped the hand that was stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. It was like a current that started in my shoulder and raced down my arm and sprang into our hands joined together. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being and bring tears to my eyes. And I said, I forgive you. I forgive you with all my heart. And for a long moment, we grasped each other's hands the former guard and the former prisoner. And I had never known 
the power of God's love so intensely as I did in that moment. Now, not many of us will be faced with such an extraordinary experience of forgiveness as Corrie Ten Boom and this prison guard. But stories such as hers tell us that radical forgiveness is possible. Though it seems that Corrie's gift of forgiveness was accomplished by the simple act of extending her hand, in truth, her journey to this point had been long and arduous. She had grieved hard for the family members that she had lost. And she had experienced the whole range of emotions, from anger and depression to a terrible sense of survivor's guilt. She had undertaken a long journey in the company of God's guiding spirit. And Corrie's journey means a lot to me because it was to her story that I turned when I was engulfed in grief over my own sister's death. Corrie's account of losing many of her family members and her road back to a life of faith and trust in God became for me a life raft to cling to. Being able to forgive can take a significant amount of time, even when we might want to rush quickly to the place of forgiveness. Because more often than not, rapid pronouncements of forgiveness are like unripe fruit, having no life-giving nourishment in them. A rapid rush to forgiveness can have its origins in shock, in denial, or in a sense of what we think we should be doing. Lasting forgiveness is something that we live our way into. And like Corrie, we might go through several stages of feelings and stages of behaviour in relation to the one who has hurt us. We may begin by feeling stunned by what has happened and not yet be fully aware of the effect that it will have on our lives over the long term. We may enter into a stage of intense anger as we become more aware of the depth of our hurt or the degree of the injustice that has been inflicted upon us. We may go through a time of searching deeply inside ourselves for why such an event has occurred in our lives asking ourselves, what did I do to contribute to this set of circumstances? What could I have done to stop it from happening? And this part of the journey is deeply harrowing. If we are in contact with the offender, we may want to punish them through passive aggressive behaviour or other ways of blaming them or shrinking their influence in our lives. We may be waiting for them to admit their fault, to apologise or to make restitution.
There is no guarantee that the person who has hurt you will be able to do that. Though in Corrie Ted Boom's case, that is what happened. But at some point on the journey of forgiveness which Christ leads us through, we will hear as if for the first time the familiar words of the Lord's Prayer. We will hear and we will know the truth of those words as we ask God to forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. We will know at that point on our journey with Christ that holding on to unforgiveness is actually going to block a full relationship with God. And we will want to let go of the slow anger that we've been nursing in our hearts. And we will want to be free of the sour taste that bitter thoughts speak into our lives and we will realise the truth of that old saying that holding on to unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Because it is true that there is an opportunity for all of us to do what Corrie Ten Boom did on that day in 1947. To enter fully into the way of life which Christ calls us to, invites us to, walks with us as we enter into it. A way of life that is about truthfulness, humility, perseverance, generosity and compassion. A way of life that is about truth because at no stage are we asked to deny or minimise the suffering we've been through. Corrie Ten Boom never minimised the impact it had upon her to suffer under the great evil of the Nazi regime. It is a way of life about humility because as we walk it, we will know that our own capacity to let go of our anger and hurt is very limited. And in humility, we will know that it is only God at work in us that can make forgiveness possible. It's about perseverance. Because the old feelings of injury will come back and will try to reclaim us. And we will need to persevere and to choose forgiveness over and over again if it is truly to be part of our way of life. And it's a way of life full of generosity and compassion. Because the act of forgiving one who has hurt us is the greatest gift of all. And as we forgive them, somehow compassion will stir in us so that we can see the hurt in them which has caused them to hurt us in the first place. The end result of this way of life that Christ calls us to 
is an extraordinary freedom. And it is a freedom that is offered to all of us as we are invited to walk it in the company of Christ. Amen. In the wake of the Taliban taking control over Afghanistan, there are so many thoughts running through everyone's minds. The world is on edge, fearful of what this could mean or lead to. But no one is more fearful than those who are currently stuck in the unsettled country, unable to get out. So let us pray. Almighty God, Lord of all the nations, we lift up the people of Afghanistan to you right now. We pray that they may cling to you and that you would cling to them and help them walk through this fearful time. We place them under the wing of your protection, like chickens under the wing of a mother hen. Be their help and comfort, we pray. May peace come to them, the peace of your powerful presence. We hold before you the people who have had to flee their homes. We pray that they will find a sense of home in their relationship with you. God of all creation, whose heart has a special place for the poor and the dispossessed. We ask that you will move in us. We are a nation blessed with the privilege of peace and democracy. Move in us that we may be generous in our response to this tragedy, opening our hearts and our homeland to a people in need. We pray for the Afghanis in our midst, those who already call Australia home. Show us how to be with them in their anguish. We pray for our defence forces as they question the events of the last 20 years. Especially we pray for our defence chaplains, that you may guide them in their ministry. We pray for all those who are facing challenges with life changes. We pray for those who are on a health journey, struggling or unwell, and those who are dying. With courage and wisdom, we pray. We join our hearts and voices as we pray the prayer that Jesus has given us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So now go boldly into the future, which God has claimed as God's own. And know that the God who holds all things will be there. That Christ who calls you friend will walk beside you. And that the Spirit who makes all things new will mark your way with light and hope. <laughs>